Hear these words from Isaiah 53. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others. A man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity, and as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked, and his tomb with The rich, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death, and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Friends, if you are able, please stand and join me in this invocation from Philippians. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, Being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And now let us sing.
You may be seated, friends. And welcome to Shepherd of the Sierra on this evening that we contemplate the crucifixion and the death of Jesus Christ in seven scenes. Tonight we will read short passages from Scripture, reflect on their meaning, and meditate on a series of images while music is being played. And so I invite you to get into a comfortable posture of prayer. And you may remain seated through uh, the remainder of this service, including the hymns. At the end of our final hymn, we're going to exit in silence after the bell is rung 33 times, signifying each year that Jesus lived. We'll be in the dark at that moment, and we will hope to see you on Easter morn. And so the first scene, Jesus judged, scourged, and mocked. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus and led him away, handed him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? He answered him, you say so. Then the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you? But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. And then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged, and the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, coming up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Jesus seems almost entirely passive. He was acted upon, but remained inactive. He was bound, led away, handed over, questioned, flogged, handed over again, flogged again, dressed up in a crown of thorns and robe, and then struck. And all this was done to him, and he did nothing about it. Accusations leveled against him, and his only, his only assertion was, you say so. Why did he do nothing? Say nothing to defend himself. Was he guilty and accepting punishment? Had he given up? Resigned to fate? He was weak against the strong, cowed before the proud, passive, inactive. Or maybe, maybe there was something powerfully active within him. Beneath a brow torn by thorns. Maybe there was a presence of mind, a focused determination. Maybe within a flogged frame, maybe the heart beat faster for love. In every labored breath, maybe the spirit of life sustained. So from one point of view, Jesus was weak. And from another, he manifested immeasurable strength. Not guilty, but gracious. Not resigned, but resolved. His love would outlast all this hatred and so much more. Please join me in meditation.
The second scene, Christ condemned to be crucified. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. Where do we find our security and freedom? Is it in our material wealth, political power, or is it in the one who is our good shepherd, our true king? For Pilate, this was an easy question. Allegiance to Rome was first and foremost. And so when the chief priests called for Jesus' crucifixion, Pilate steps back, reminding the chief priests that this upstart rebel is their problem, not his. His rejection of Jesus seems rather matter of fact, just another bureaucratic issue to be quickly settled. But then the chief priests, those people called to be the representatives before God of the people of God, they do the very thing that denies the most essential truth of their faith, that God is the only true king. In crying out that they have no king but the emperor, they deny God and instead align themselves with people like Pilate, the ones who find the most expedient way to be done with public unrest. With their king and God before them, they turn their backs enslaving themselves to a system that will never give them the freedom and power they so desire. Please join me in meditation.
the third scene, Jesus helped by a Cyrenian. As they led him away, they seized a man, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming from the country. And they laid the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. And a great number of the people followed him, and among them were women who were beating their breasts and wailing for him. Simon, an outsider from from North Africa, is made to carry the crossbeam Jesus would soon be fixed upon. Jesus walks steps ahead. The women wail. They were not in the crowd that shouted, Crucify him! They weep loudly at the sight of another son sentenced to death. These are cries of injustice. These cries over innocent sons echo across time and space, heard in Alsip, Illinois, by the Till family, and Houston, Texas, by the Floyd family, and so many other places, far too many places where mothers weep for innocent sons. Christ is still crucified, and women still wail for him. When? When will these cries of injustice be heard as cries for justice? Those who led Jesus and Simon away did not listen. Will we? Please join me in meditation. Fourth scene, Jesus Christ crucified. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. They cast lots to divide his clothing. Judged and condemned. Jesus was crucified a criminal. He was, like so many before and after him, given no fair trial. An angry mob decided his fate. Hardly afforded a hearing, He was granted no pardon, so he was hung on a cross as a criminal, and his executioners, they gambled on his clothing. They taunted him with suggestions and sour wine. They had no sympathy. And Jesus showed empathy. They don't know what they're doing, he prayed. He excused their behavior on an assumption an assumption of of ignorance. He asked that they be pardoned. Father, forgive them, he prayed. Jesus 
was persecuted for what was apparently unpardonable, but he sought exoneration for his executioners. What kind of justice is this? The righteous one was wronged. The wrongdoers are rectified. Jesus Christ is, as one theologian said, the judged judge. And his decision was handed down from the cross. And it was grace. Please join me in meditation. The fifth scene, Christ among the criminals. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? 
And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man, he has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus, remember me, the criminal says to Jesus. In these, the final moments of his life, this criminal hopes to outlive his short life in some way, to be remembered. Rather than mocking and deriding Jesus as the first criminal does, this second criminal sees who Jesus is. He knows Jesus by name. He acknowledges Jesus' innocence as well as his own guilt. In asking Jesus to remember him, he holds out hope that his mistakes and missteps will not have the final word. And indeed, they will not. Today, Jesus tells him, you will be with me in paradise. Our faith is not a faith pointed merely at some distant heaven. It is a faith that is alive today that proclaims a love for us today, despite our failings before God. Jesus offers this man and each one of us much more than we have asked for. Instead of simply being remembered at some far off time, we will be with Jesus, brought into God's presence today and every day. Please join me in meditation. The sixth scene, Jesus before his beloved. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. As Jesus hangs on the cross, his gaze falls on those whom he loves, his mother and a beloved disciple. Even at the point of death, Jesus looks beyond himself to those who will carry on after his death. In Mary, we see both a beginning and an end. The one who responds in faith to God's call to be part of the incarnation, the one who will bear the Christ child, and the one who now sits at the foot of the cross, watching the one on whom the promises of God rest, breathe his last. In the beloved disciple, we see the one who follows Christ and who is now tasked with creating a new family, mother and son, son and mother. In the new creation, these bonds will move beyond blood, 
bringing us each into Christ's body and God's family. In this new creation, those promises that were proclaimed by Mary and that will be preached in all nations by beloved disciples like this, they come together at this moment, a new creation and a new family bound in the love of Christ. Please join me in meditation. seventh and final scene, the death of the Lord. It was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon while the sun's light failed. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit." Having said this, he breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two. Now, there were at least two curtains of the temple in Jerusalem. One separated the outside from the sanctuary, and one separated the sanctuary from the most sacred space. Which one was ripped? We don't know. The detail doesn't really matter because the point is clear. God tore the curtain, the veil, the divide. God rips our partitions. No separation from outside and inside, no insider, no outsider, no clean and unclean, no sacred or profane. Jesus lived by this. And at his death, the last curtain was torn. There is no barrier between God and you and me and you and any other person in this room here or hereafter. God's love tears through every curtain and cracks every wall. No more separation. Not after this good Friday. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate, separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Please join me in meditation.
Please bow your heads and join me in this prayer that's adapted from the Northumbria community. When Jesus Christ was misunderstood, he silently forgave, but we so often respond in anger. Lord, have mercy. You gave us opportunity to choose Jesus, but for so long we have chosen the rebellion that demanded his death. Lord, have mercy. He was scourged and wounded. He deserved no punishment. He embraced the cross. Lord, thank you. He shouldered the cross, but his body was weak, still is weak. Your people shrink from the weight of suffering. Lord, have mercy. As Simon took the weight of the cross from Jesus, you have taught us that we must bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. May we carry the cross. No robe was left upon his tired shoulders, just a crown of mockery on his head. Still he was king. He loved and won rejection and pain, but still he loved. May we be open to you and to each other. He was lifted high upon that cross, even as he had prophesied when he promised, I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to me. It was love that held him there. What love is this of his? He endured malice and hate and still spoke of forgiveness and pardon. Abandoned and forsaken, he gave himself over. Your love has no limits. When all is dark and hope is buried, it is hard to trust his words that promised before the pain. He died that I might live. Amen.
Oh